Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations on Sex, Addiction, and Relationships. I'm Tim Stein, and I'm joined today with my friends Dan Drake, Wendy Conquest, and Jeannie Vitoni. How are you all doing today? <laughs> Good. I, I, you're you're going to fire a mailbag question, so I'm I'm a little uh, feeling a little anxious. I don't know what we're going to get. I am. Well, we're going to we're going to get into mailbox, and we don't all know what the questions are. So, just for the listeners to understand, like. Tim's got the questions and uh, you guys are going to get us being spontaneous and knowledgeable and hopefully we have great things to say. I'm in the position. These are questions that people have mailed in. So with every episode that we do, we invite people to send questions. So these are questions from our listeners. Thank you very much for sending them. Thank you for sending them. Absolutely. So here is our first question. Could a sexless long-term marriage be a reason for sex addiction? Can I go first? You can go go first. first. I know your answer. (laughs) No. (laughs) No. And, okay, so now here's my long version, right? A sexless marriage, yes, that may, if it's not both people's choice together, that could have many difficulties and problems and stuff to talk about. However, sexlessness does not create addiction. In someone's mind, it might be their rationale justification to continue an addictive behavior or poor decision-making or bad judgment, but sexless marriage does not mean that is the cause of an addiction. Addictions usually start so much earlier you know in the emotional landscape of what's going on so that's my first what do you guys think well i I heard this question different i heard is sexlessness a reason for sex addiction so what i heard was if i'm in a sexless marriage does that mean that my partner's sex addicted that's what i heard and i would say if you if if your partner is not interested in sex it doesn't necessarily mean that they're acting out with other sexual content oh so you were saying if we're sex if we're if we're not having sex does that automatically mean that someone is is either addicted to sex or um betraying inv- b- vows and such like stepping out right that's what i heard oh, oh how interesting it's not what i heard right. what about you guys what did you hear dan i heard it I went two different ways. I could see someone um, on the one hand, let's say for whatever reason, um, the the partner or the um, the relationship for whatever reason, there's some issue. They're not they're not having sex or they're not able to, or they you know it's it's ceased on some level. That um, like a justification for the the betrayer to go outside the relationship. I heard that. Or, but I, what what I would most likely what I do see is is what I would imagine. Is this is about probably more intimacy anorexia that's what i see or sexual anorexia so i don't know we can go down that road i'd love to talk about that for a second if we can um sexual, but se- anorexia? sexual anorexia patrick Carnes talked about sexual anorexia um doug weiss is the first person i've heard talk about intimacy anorexia mm-hmm. as the pervasive pattern of withholding in the relationship um and i usually see those men, typically men I've worked with, with this, they'll, they'll tend to be, um, very afraid of rejection. So they'll, they'll stay pretty guarded. They're very hypersensitive to criticism. They'll kind of be guarded, very walled up and guarded. Um, they'll, they'll kind of keep their partner at bay. So, and they'll, they'll do things where they'll kind of invite connection, but then push the partner away. And in those cases, I see those, those men may very well act out with porn and masturbation as a substitute for sexuality that they're not taking risks for they're not engaging in the relationship so i do see that happen a lot it's not the sexlessness that caused the addiction i think it's i would say it's a bigger more pervasive problem of the uh, intimacy disorder that sex addiction is so i don't know if what you guys are hearing but that's what i we, see it as we know that sex addiction has its roots in childhood has its roots in trauma <clears throat> and has its roots in the neurology that gets wired into their brain as they're managing their trauma and they have found sexual behaviors as a way to to take the edge off and to not be overwhelmed by their trauma. So sexlessness in a marriage, from my perspective, is absolutely not something that causes sex addiction. 
I do think that there's a, a an interesting question, which is, is it the chicken or the egg? Is it that there's sexlessness in the marriage and um, uh, and that sexlessness is coming from some reason? Or I've also seen many times, you know, addicts like like Wendy was saying, you know, it's not if you're if you're in a sexless marriage, it doesn't mean your partner's a sex addict, but sometimes it does. You know, sometimes the addicts are taking their sexual behavior outside. Sometimes addicts have a, have a, an attachment wound where they're unable to combine sexual eroticism and relational connection. And so they have, they have to be in a relationship with the Madonna, but they act out with the horror and they separated those two things. Um, but also I've worked with many partners whose libido is just sort of naturally shut down and they weren't aware of why and they weren't happy with it, but it was a self-protection mechanism from feeling objectified by the addict. So th there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, but you know, my, my simple answer is no, a sexless marriage does not cause sex addiction. So would all of us agree to that? I would definitely say I do not, I wouldn't, I would say that. You would say that. You I would, would say, say no? that, that I would say no, that, yeah, okay. that sexlessness does not cause sex addiction. Okay. We're right. We're all, right. all right. What else okay. you got in that box of goodies over there, Mr. Stein? How do you not enable the sex addict's behavior? How do you not? Okay, hold on. There's a, I feel like there's a double negative in there, so I got to do some flipping. The, a partner is afraid that in some way they are enabling the addict's behavior. How can a partner avoid enabling the addict's addictive behavior? I don't see partners enabling right. addict behavior, though. I see, I, yeah, I, yeah. I see <laughs> what by staying in the relationship and not leaving is that what we're calling an that doesn't seem like enabling. Um, if someone's saying they step on their own value system and say, yes, do your behaviors, even though I don't like it or agree with it, but I'm just not going to say anything. Or I'm maybe going to facilitate something I, that might be enabling, but I, I don't know. I, I guess I would want to back up. I'm not sure I see most partners that I've worked with enabling the addict behaviors. Do you guys? Well, well I think that one of the pieces is um, so a lot of partners will say, okay, you know, because there's a sex or porn addiction, if I have more sex with them, then they won't, you know, they won't do those behaviors. Um, so uh, so, so that that's a fallacy. Uh, no matter how much um, sex uh, part or uh, how, how much sex is going on in a primary relationship, that is not going to deter someone with sex addiction from acting out. Um, so let's just put put that down um, on the foundation. Um, so um, I, I my my so we we talk about right with sex addiction is holding the the addicts accountable. Um, and this is an area that I'm consistently curious about because the partners will say, well, I don't want to be their accountability, something, something. And, and a lot of times that goes to, well, I'm not going to ask them about their meetings. I'm not going to ask them about recovery. I'm not going to ask them about anything that's their business. And so, uh, either they're doing their work or they're not. And, um, uh, we we just we did an uh, interview with Michelle Mays, um, and her work is very attachment based, and so I think that flies against um, this newer body of research that we're finding is that in any relationship there is attachment. So why wouldn't a partner go to the addict and say, "I want to know how you're doing. I want to know how recovery is going. I want to understand more about your internal process with this whole dynamic." Um, so, uh, so where am I with the enablement piece? I honestly think that, you know, enabling an addict is, is basically saying not enabling, but maybe not helpful to say you do what you're doing and I don't care. Just come to me healed kind of thing. The word enable is really catching me. Um, because I, I, I don't see it as enabling and I can hear people's stories of trying to help mm -hmm. and I can see a pathological view of that's enabling, which is, which is bad. 
And really it's not, it's I'm trying to help my loved one. I'm trying to make sense of this crazy situation. I'm I don't understand what's going on. Together. I'm trying I'm to keep a try- relationship together. I'm trying to keep a together. relationship together. And and so when actually I'm hearing this question from the mail, the mailbag, when I'm taking it as how can I not impact my person's addictive behavior? Like if I'm choosing to not have sex with them because I don't feel comfortable to do so, am I interacting? Am I influencing their addiction? Am I um, accidentally making it worse, for example? Or let's go for the flip one. If I'm choosing to have a lot more sex because I'm trying to (laughs) find a way to help my loved one, I just, I feel like it's always back to the person trying to, betray partner usually, trying to make sense of it and trying to help the situation, um, which sometimes can backfire accidentally. But even on those situations, let's say- But it's not enable. But even if if the addict is triggered one way or the other, that's still their responsibility to to use their recovery tools. So if I'm- 1,000%. If I'm, you know- emotionally triggered by something or, you know, sexually, whatever it, it, it's, it's my responsibility to take, to take care of that in a healthy way and not go act out. Right. Like that's not, so yes. it's not Did the part anything of I say, give, no, give no, 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 otherwise? no, not at all. I was like, Oh my God, let no, no, me no. back up the bus. Not at all. No, I just, okay. I'm, I'm thinking because that sometimes gets put on the partner, you know, if you only did X, Y, and Z, or you didn't do this, or you gave like, then it, it it's, and that becomes part of gaslighting and putting that on the partner and responsibility on the partner when it's not, it's the, it's the, right. sure. There's things that can help or harm, but that's not the partner's job to manage. Right. Right. That's part and, of that accountability and responsibility taking. And there's a lot of nuance. I mean, you know, I, I I'm very fond of telling people I work with, look, everybody's unique and nobody's unique which means that there are some general patterns we see, but every person, every relationship, every addict, every partner is going to have their nuances. And so, you know, it's not like there's really an effective do these things and don't do those things and everything's going to be fine. I think if a partner is worried about, and I agree with you, Jeannie, I, I don't like the word enable. It feels very pathologizing. But if a partner is worried that what they're doing is in somehow um, facilitating the addict's addictive behaviors and creating more chaos in their life, the addict's life, and the people around them's life. I, I think it's a piece of, well, step back. Well, is this working? This is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. I'm trying for the best. I'm not going to beat myself up for that, but is it actually working? And let's let's look at the reality of, is this getting me the result that I'm hoping it would create or is it not? And if it's not, then maybe we need to acknowledge that and ask for help and guidance from other people and doing it differently. The end. Great. No, I actually have one more thing I want to say. All Sorry. right. Okay. <laughs> not the end. I was lying. Sorry. <laughs> I I just, and, and if, if this blows things up, we can totally take it out. That's totally fine. It can be the end. Um, I still think though, so it's not enabling on any level. So I want to take that word out of it. Yes. But what I've experienced, what I've seen, and I'm just curious for you all, is for the betrayer, for the addict, until the pain of of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change, they don't move. So sometimes that means they they finally get that the partner's serious about this. So they get the betrayal. They get the impact. You know, it means sometimes it's all the way to I'm filing divorce for a divorce if you can't, if you aren't willing to to do the work. So sometimes, and I, I don't know what to call that. So I'm not saying if you don't go to those lengths, that's not enabling. So I would never say that, of course, but I've just seen those situations where until the, the betrayer fully gets that this is really serious, sometimes if it's like comfortable enough, they don't make major shifts. So well, let's, mm-hmm. isn't that well, human let's behavior? The- isn't that human behavior? That that discomfort sometimes comes from the partner, but sometimes the addict gets to that point on their own. And so I agree with you that until it's uncomfortable enough, the addict isn't going to change. But sometimes addicts walk in to my office saying, I'm miserable. This isn't working. I want to change. And sometimes- That's great, but that's rare for my for me, what I see. Uh, I, w- I, I have about okay. 25 to 35% of the guys that walk in my office 
that whether the partner has said you need to go do the work or not, they're walking, maybe if it's maybe it's even 50-50, that'll walk in, they're like, this isn't working for me. I want to be different. I don't know how to. I've been trying. I can't stop. I mean, addiction. But um, but sometimes but that that's just still... because of the partner sort of putting boundaries in place or whatever they're doing, sometimes that 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 comes internally from the addict and their own personal experience. Whether it comes from locus of control or origin, rather, from betrayed partner into the relationship or from the addict, I think going back to the real truth, the biological truth of something Dan just said, which is until what I'm doing is uncomfortable enough, we humans tend to tolerate a lot. And so it has. And so, Dan, can you go back and say it again? Because you said it so beautifully. And it's, it's a, I think it's a really human thing and we're just applying it into these situations. Yeah. Most of us, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I know this is a quote and I'm, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't, I've heard it passed down, so I'm going to butcher it, but this is yeah. the, the idea is most of us don't change until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. There it is. There it is. And again, I just want to emphasize the humanness of that. Yeah. No matter if the situation, the relationship, the addiction, the 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 pain of staying the same is no longer an option. And I would also add that a partner, some partners will try to motivate the addict to change. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I I I consistently don't find that that behavior or words from that place works. When the partner is unequivocal unequivocal and un- when they're certain thank you <laughs> certain of what where they stand that is much more powerful than trying to think up what they can do or say to change the addict's behavior it's so hard that's just so hard i want to you know now we're going on down another street but oh, hold on uh, here here's another hold question on. let me let me do Wait, the so hard part because you know, betrayed partners, they want healing. They want healing. They want healthy relationships. And of course they do. Everybody does. And so um, they're trying to think of, well, what, what could I do? What could we do? What could I ask him to do or her to do? Um, Because they're seeking, they're seeking health and truth and connection. So I just want to acknowledge the heart of that, the pain of that. Okay, Tim, back to you. Okay. So, <laughs> what was that look on your face, Tim? Well, okay, here's here's where I'm going. Uh-oh. What Jeannie just said <laughs> isn't exclusive to the partner. Mm-hmm. Addicts want love and acceptance and connection. Mm-hmm. Now, and when we talk clinically about sex addiction, we talk about it as an intimacy disorder. That's what addicts want at their core, but reaching out and being vulnerable with another person doesn't feel safe to them. And so they found these sexual behaviors to give them an artificial hit for that. So when we're talking about this, I, I want to be be cautious that we don't just assume that it's only the partners who want that intimacy and that connection. Addicts want it too. Some of them actively want it with their partner. They just don't know how to go there because it the, they're their pain and the trauma and all the stuff underneath driving it has been so ingrained and they desperately want it to be different. They're having a hard time getting there, but it's not for a lack of desire for that connection, that intimacy, that love and acceptance. So thank you for saying that. Cause that is not my, um, uh, where, what I wanted to say, I was just coming and off of what Wendy yeah. had talked about, which was specific to betrayed partners. And so, um, yes, but it is there for both. And we have relationship partners and we have a betrayal trauma or a partner specific mailbag today. So here's the next question. Oh, these are all, these are all betrayal partner focused. Uh, uh, yeah, kind of. All righty. Next one. All right. And this fits in with all the stuff we've been talking about. What's the best role a partner can take towards the addicted spouse, how to hold boundaries while not being their therapist or their sponsor. Oof. Good one. Okay, what's the what was the first question? Because I I I had a really fast response for that one. What's the best role for a partner to take? Now I'm I'm going to say I kind of asked, how do I do this perfectly? And it's not going to be the same answer for everyone. But what is an effective role for a partner to take? Let's change it there. What's an effective role for a partner to take 
how can they be supportive of the addict, but not become their therapist and not become their sponsor or See, cheerleader or cheerleader. To right. Right. Which, which could be a choice because it's not bad to be a cheerleader, but it's just not responsibility and obligation to be a cheerleader. I, I went back to, I, I think, how do I say this? First step for my recommendation, how can I be supportive of someone else, but not losing myself? So betrayed partner really coming into awareness about what what are my emotional needs, physical needs, sexual needs? What do I like? What do I value? What is the way I conceptualize this? And then through that sense of knowing self and what would I like to choose to offer in support of my loved one who's who's trying to do this addiction treatment or in support of this loved one who perhaps really possibly betrayed me. But I, I would encourage betrayed partners to start with self because then you can make more of an informed choice about what would I like to offer and gift or extend of myself. What do you guys think about that? Well, I think this is a complicated question. <laughs> For sure. um, so I really want anyone, um, but certainly a betrayed partner to know when they're in trauma. So when I'm in the room with a, a, a addict or a partner, doesn't you know, or both, when anybody is um, increasing their um, increasing their speech, so the speech is getting very fast, it's getting very high, it's getting they're repeating things a lot. That to me, that's a sign you're in trauma. Um, so, um, so sometimes I will ask people to de definitely do active listening. You know, what did you hear the other person say? Um, but for, since this partner is saying, well, what can I do? I would say, um, first of all, if you want to be supportive, write out what you're going to say ahead of time. And it should be maybe three sentences. Not compound sentences. <laughs> of, of support. Three sentences, whatever you want to say, I would say whatever you want to say about three sentences so that you are being very uh, cognizant about what you want to say, how you want to say it. And, you know, is this really, you know, what I'm trying to communicate so that there's not repetition, the other person isn't getting flooded, the other person um, isn't uh, saying things that they they maybe don't want to say. Are you talking about like difficult conversations or just mm -mm. regular I, old conversations, say three sentences at a time? The very beginning, just try it. Hmm. Because I think that um, from discovery to disclosure and after disclosure, there's so many overwhelming feelings, so many overwhelming thoughts that um, I, how can anybody trust themselves that what they're saying is truly on point and truly what they want to say? So what I find a lot is that partners will overdo it and, um, and then the addict uh, uh, gets flooded or is very confused about what the partner is saying or not saying. Um, so how do we simplify communication hone it in. Um, and so, you know, so that the partner also has a, a checkpoint for themselves. What would you say, Tim, is, is something that a bud trade partner could do to help? Because I mean, that's the question. Getting is back. it help or role to take? Can you read it again? The, the, the oh, question yeah. was okay. what role to take. And as I'm thinking oh. about it, I'll, let's go backwards. I mean, when you think about a therapist, and I'm going to oversimplify here just for simplicity's sake, a therapist's role is to help people put pieces together so they can understand where something came from and how to change that behavior or how to change that dynamic. And a sponsor's role is to hold someone accountable and to guide them through, through the steps. And so as a partner, it's going to be ineffective if you're busy as the partner of an addict trying to help them understand their, their background and get them to change their behaviors. That, that, that's not you're going to step into all kinds of things and you're going to get pushback from your partner who doesn't like you meddling and taking that kind of control. Also, it's not going to be helpful as a partner if you're stepping into 
you know, you need to be accountable and I'm going to be your sponsor and make sure that you're doing everything you need to do. And are you working your steps and are you living up to that? that that's somebody else's job. As a partner, the role that you can take on actually is be the partner. If you're hurt and you're angry, be hurt and angry and, and express that and talk about it appropriately. If you're you're feeling uh, hopeful, share that you're hopeful. You know, if you've got fear and concern, share that you have fear and concern and, and ask that the addict work with you around that. You know, but but really the best role you can be in is as the partner. And I I know that that's not easy because when you're a partner and you've got that trauma and you're definitely trying to do safety seeking and protection and make sure that you're okay, that, you know, there's all kinds of things of, I desperately want to do this because I don't want to be hurt again. But the most effective role, if you're able to manage it, is be the partner and and be honest about what your experience is as that partner. That's that's my take. I agree. And I have a wrench. Ah. Okay. The wrench is, I, I don't disagree. And those roles being clearly defined and delineated sounds great, but we know some people don't seek therapy. Some people don't have a sponsor or they don't do this program, blah, blah, blah. There's all that stuff. But the thing is, I've, I've just seen partners are more aware of the train wreck coming than the addict is oftentimes. So they'll see the warning signs. They'll be, they'll see the lead up. They'll see other things starting to slip, you know, it may not be the actual, we, they don't, the relapse isn't happening right now, but they're seeing all these other warning signs that the addict seems clueless about. So now what does that partner do? Because, mm -hmm. okay, I don't want to be sponsor. I don't want to be therapist. And yet I see this train wreck and the addict is like, no, it's, I'm fine. When they, when we know they're probably not fine. So. So, so there's a so, difference between <laughs> the therapist role, which is. So there it is. So is, what? <laughs> so, so let's, let's understand the origins of this and what are you going to do? What's your plan? Right. And, let you know that digging that, into it and try and like uh get to that. The, and, right. and a sponsor you know and, and the sponsor is gonna be like you know you're missing this this is what you need to do you need to call me you're not calling me you need to step in come on what are we doing we're working the steps if that's coming up as a partner you know go go to the addict and say hey i've got some concerns i'm seeing these red flags that are coming up for me and they're bringing a concern and i am worried that you're heading down this pathway no i'm fine i'm fine so, okay, it, would so be, it would be meaningful for me if you would have this conversation with guys in program and just see if they see something going on as well. And then if you could come back and let me know what your thoughts are. Or if, you, if you're in therapy, can, go talk to your therapist about this. Maybe I am just in my own stuff and I'm hyper reacted to something. But if you would please go explore that with other people and then come back to me, that'd be great. Now, if you're an addict and you're listening to this, the correct answer is not what Dan said. No, I'm fine. And when you go talk to people, the correct answer is not coming back and saying, I talked with them and I'm not seeing anything. I'm fine. The and or, no, no, first there's another step. Actually talk to those people and, oh, yes. don't, and don't give them the skewed, oh, my wife is kind of crazy and she thinks blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, give, <laughs> be real about it and take it right. with seriousness. Right. And if you find something, come back to your partner and say, here's what I realized, here's what's going on, and here's my plan. But if you talk to all those people and you come up with nothing, the answer is, and I'm giving you the answer here, just, just say these words. The answer is, I talked with them and I'm not seeing something, but you might be picking up on something that's not on our radar. So I'm going to be extra careful with my program extra careful with my boundaries. And I really appreciate you sharing your concerns with me. Yeah. That's the right answer. And I want to, I also just want to validate, you know, that betrayed partners, you know, when, when, because a lot of betrayed partners, right. Read all the information list, you know, okay. You know, there's this intensive, you can do, you can do this, you can do that. They really want the addict to stop their behavior and to figure out, you know, what caused the behavior and to put in place things so that the behavior doesn't happen again, you know? So I, I sometimes find that the, the, the partners, you know, really watching and waiting, is this going to change? And so I just want to validate how frustrating it can be for a partner, you know, when the addict says, yeah, well, you know, we, we, we had a family dinner tonight, so I missed my meeting. I, I thought the family dinner was more important and the partner's like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, no, your recovery, like the partner knows, I think that the recovery is most important 
Although I have had situations where they say, hey, aren't you going to be at the kid's birthday party? And sure. And the addict says, wow, my recovery, what, you know, what's most important? But then family that's a family stuff, discussion. Right? Family stuff or or uh, or recovery stuff. And and as Jeannie said, you know, the, the, it has to be part of the discussion. Um, but I find what happens a lot is that the addicts are not communicating well, it's an intimacy disorder. So this is a new skill. I have to, if I'm going to a meeting, I have to learn how to communicate and what I'm going to communicate to my partner when I get back home. And to start that higher level of connection and, and information sharing. And Tim, I like Tim's answer. That is the answer. Don't, I've heard too many people use some version of well, just remember, this is progress, not perfection. You know, you can't expect me to be perfect. And that's like the end of the story or something. That's not that's not the right answer. So rewind what Tim just said and use that. I agree. So so to repeat, it's I may not be seeing it. I'll go check with my people. I I know that you see things before, before I do. I'll keep this in mind. I know I'll make an extra phone call. Thanks for bringing it to my attention. And then do it. And then, and then do it. Do, do it. it. Do it. <laughs> Thank you all for the mailbag questions. Keep them coming. I know we've got more, but I also know we're running out of time today. That's it for today. And uh, if you're, well, whatever platform you're listening to us on, please like us and rate us. It actually makes a significant difference in people being able to find us out there. And we are so passionate about bringing the message and the fun um, to all the people out there. And uh, also, if you have questions for us that you would like to have us address in a future mailbag, send those to us at conversations.sar at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us in this conversation. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.